Uh, we have a very special guest today, uh, and I just was joking. The CIA always comes on the side door. They don't come through the front door. Uh, that was fun to see that. The last person that did that is actually one of your former bosses, Secretary Clinton, uh, also came through that door, just so you know. Um, uh, director Burns, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, however, is no, this is his second time here in the last two years. Uh, the last time we had the pleasure of hosting you, Bill, when your new book came out. It's still available on Amazon, and I think you can still buy it, even though he has a new job. It's called The Back Channel, A Memoir of American Diplomacy and the Case for Its Renewal. And let me just say, before we get to what we're going to talk about today, uh, there aren't many excellent books on diplomacy. One of them was written by our colleague that just passed away recently, and we just celebrated his life, uh, George Schultz, uh, who you had the, the, the fortune to work with uh, at the State Department. But Bill, I actually think your book is, is, is one of those great books about diplomacy, and uh, I use it in, in my teaching, and if you're interested in diplomacy, uh, buy that book. Uh, if you're interested in, in intelligence, however, we're gonna shift gears now. Um, uh, and it's, it is really my pleasure to welcome you back. Uh, Bill has a giant, uh, and I don't, can I call you Bill or can I, okay. Call me Bill. It, it says in my notes, his name is Director Burns, but um, um, we just had Director Abizade here last week too, and that was hard for me to say, and finally she just said, just call me Christy. So, That's a lot um, easier. Bill, as everybody here knows, has one of the most distinguished careers anybody's ever had in the State Department. He was career ambassador, the second serving career diplomat to serve as deputy secretary. He basically had every interesting job. I'm looking at, I'm not going to read them all, Bill, but every interesting job you could have at the State Department and at the National Security Council, uh, including one we shared uh, in Russia when, when I was nominated for that job. You told me it's the best job you'll ever have, and it was. It was a fantastic job. Um, and just let me say thank you, Bill, for all of your mentorship that we did together in the government. Uh, I learned more about diplomacy and policymaking from you than anybody else, so it's a real honor to have you back here. In his new job, though, he's not making policy anymore, and we're gonna talk about that in questions. Uh, he is the only career diplomat to serve as the director of the CIA. Um, and as you were just telling me, it was a bit of a surprise for you to take that job. So, welcome back to Stanford, first of all. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna do uh, three different pieces. We're gonna talk amongst ourselves for about 20 minutes. We're then gonna go to the audience for another 20, and if we have a few minutes left, we'll go to the virtual audience Great. with your permission. Great. So let's just first talk about that transition. You spent most of your career uh, over at the State Department. You did have a, a time at the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, when you were here last, you were the president of the Carnegie Endowment. Our colleague has now replaced you, right. uh, Tina Cuellar, right. for those of you who didn't know that news. But that's a big change to go from the state, well, maybe, maybe not, you tell us. What, just tell us at 30,000 feet, and then we'll dig into some yeah. of the policy things in a minute, but what is it like to move from the State Department over to the CIA in terms of culture, organization, yeah. mission statement? How would you describe it? Well, well, first, it's great to be back at Stanford. It's hard to believe it was only two years ago, but this was before COVID and certainly before I had any idea I'd come back into government, let alone as director of CIA. And it's always great to be with you, Mike. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I think over almost three and a half decades as a career diplomat, you know, I, I had served with CIA colleagues overseas as well as in Washington and had developed a great deal of respect for their professionalism and their dedication. Um, and so I, I really am convinced that, um, and I know that, you know, working with those colleagues over those nearly 35 years made me a better diplomat, a better negotiator, a better policymaker because of the intelligence that they collected and the insights that they provided. And I'd like to think at least, I hope, that my experience as an ambassador, as a policymaker, will make me a better director of CIA. In other words, better able to connect the work that we do at CIA to what matters most to policymakers. And in the seven months, almost seven months now that I've been at CIA, that has really been reinforced in my mind as well. You know, there are the, the obvious differences between the two institutions and the two professions, the most obvious of which, of course, is that, you know, I spent many years 
you know, finishing as the number two in the State Department, helping to shape policy in modest ways. My job now, the job of the CIA, is to support policymakers with our intelligence, hopefully of high quality and hopefully timely. It's not to become a policymaker as well. So I have to tell my colleagues, our former friends around the White House Situation Room table to kick me under the table if I start to stray <laughs> in the other direction. Um, but there are also some similarities as well, I think, in the sense that for both diplomats and intelligence officers, one of the big challenges is all about understanding and navigating foreign landscapes. Um, and what that requires is the obvious, it's foreign languages, it's an understanding of history and culture, an understanding of your own tradecraft in those two very different professions. Um, it, it's also about creating more diverse institutions, I think, which is a challenge still for both the State Department and CIA. We're not gonna be an effective intelligence organization if everybody at CIA looks like me. Um, we're an, an, an agency with global reach, and what that means is we've gotta reflect the diversity of our own society if we're gonna be effective around the world as well. And then the last thing I'd say in terms of similarities is I think both of those professions require a sense of humility in the following sense, that as you know from your own experience in Russia, um, you know, a lot of times I think Americans think that everything's all about us. And the truth is that, you know, whether it's the, the most complicated and difficult leaderships like Vladimir Putin's Russia or lots of other places in the world are gonna have perspectives that are not identical to us. And what that means for diplomats or intelligence officers is not that you need to accept or indulge those perspectives, but understanding them is the starting point for effective intelligence work and effective diplomacy. So there are, in many respects, I think more similarities than differences when you look at that. Dig a little in more into that separation between being part of the IC and at the head of, you know, sitting at the White House Situation Room. For those who don't understand it, when you have a principals committee or an NSC meeting, you're at the table representing the CIA but you're not supposed to, at least that's the norms, talk about policy. How does that work in reality? You've spent your entire life thinking about policy. In fact, I wanna share with you uh, a phrase that Bill used to use when I was in the government. Um, we would be in the situation room on some kind of problem and at, at some point along the way you would say, okay, we've done a great job admiring the problem. Forgive me for that. Um, it's the KGB. No, I'm just kidding. Um, actually, yeah, I'm probably not kidding. Um, uh, you would, you'd always say, we've done a great job of admiring the problem. Now we have to come up with some solutions. But there's this divide between yeah. intelligence and coming up with solutions. How, how does that work practically, and, and especially with your peers who you've worked with for literally some of them for decades that expect you to solve problems? Yeah, although, I mean, I'm, it's kind of liberating in a way, to be honest with you, when you can sort of lay out what is oftentimes a kind of grim intelligence landscape and then say, okay, over to you guys to okay. choose, choose between what is oftentimes bad and worse policy choices as well. But no, I think part of the obligation for CIA, for an intelligence agency, is to be very mindful of the ways in which policymakers are gonna to have to wrestle with choices, to right. be very mindful of the fact that, again, as you know, and as Frank and others here know from, from your own experience in government, you're always gonna be dealing with unforgiving time pressures, incomplete information. And so what you wanna do is frame um, that intelligence and those insights in ways that, which are gonna be most useful to policymakers. So right. in that sense, I think, it helps enormously to have a sense of what it's like to be on, to the, be on other the other side, side of the table. That's yeah. a great point. Uh, so recently you've announced, I mean, maybe there's other things that we don't know about, right, uh, that you've changed, but publicly there's been some pretty big organizational changes that you announced at the CIA. Uh, tell us what they are and explain why you've done them. Well, part of it, you know, when I, when I arrived at CIA, I remember even in my confirmation hearing, what I tried to do was lay out a picture of the, the landscape that not only CIA has to operate on around the world, but also the United States does. And I think, you know, this is one of those moments of transition for the United States that comes along two or three times a century. And, and you know, as I look back on American history, um, this is one of those moments when we're seeing pretty profound changes um, in relationships among states, particularly with the rise of China, the single biggest 
geopolitical challenge, I think, that the United States faces. But that's also inevitably going to be a balancing act, too, because it's not as if we can afford to neglect other more familiar challenges, whether it's Russia, Iran, North Korea, terrorism as well. So that's one feature. A second feature is, is, are the challenges that come, in a sense, beyond states. So climate change, the biggest existential threat that any of us face in human society, global health insecurity, and then especially the revolution in technology, which as many of you in this room know, is transforming the way in which we live, work, fight, and compete with profound implications for what the CIA does too, in terms of our operational tradecraft overseas, when you are you know, trying to serve in environments characterized by ubiquitous technical surveillance, it means we have to rethink the way in which we work with human sources overseas. It has a huge influence in terms of what we do in cyber and technology issues as well, both in terms of cyber defense, how do we ensure security of things that we want to protect, but you know, also understand ways in which we can anticipate challenges that are going to come, whether it's from foreign state actors or non-state actors increasingly. Uh, and then in terms of our analysis too, we're living in an age in which data is just uh, an avalanche right now. So it's to make use of AI and machine learning so that we can work our way through the haystacks of data and open source information and get at the needles that are going to be most important to a good intelligence and smart policy making as well. So what that led me to do in my confirmation hearing is to lay out a series of what I thought at the time were the main priorities that we needed to reinforce. Again, not at the expense of all those other challenges, but that we needed to reinforce as you look at over the next few decades. So China, technology, partnerships, and people. And you know, I spent most of the last seven months traveling extensively overseas to talk to our colleagues there and stations, talk to a lot of smart people at headquarters. I'm by nature a wanderer, and so I wanted to both introduce myself and hear what people thought. We set in motion a sort of more formal review process as well, which produced a lot of thoughtful recommendations about a month ago, many of which a week or so ago I announced and we've set in motion. So on China, it was to create uh, a single China mission center as a way of ensuring that since China and that geopolitical challenge cuts across literally everything we do at the agency, to make sure that we were focusing and integrating that work in the most effective way possible. I've started, I will start shortly, a weekly meeting just focused on that mission center and on China. Exactly what my predecessors and I have done for 20 years on counterterrorism issues. So it's a way to send that signal. Um, and then on technology, to announce the establishment of a chief technology officer position, right. not as another layer on top of what are extremely well-run directorates now, but as someone who can challenge conventional wisdom, deepen our connections to the private sector where the pace of innovation is going to outstrip anything that even the smartest parts of government can do right, right. now set up a new mission center, a second new mission center, focused on transnational issues and technology, again, to deepen the connection to everything from you know, private sector actors to the scientific establishment, academic experts, so that you know, we can better not just keep pace but get out ahead of rivals on a right. whole range of technology issues. And then last but not least on workforce issues, to speed up significantly the amount of time it takes for people to get in um, to the agency. It takes way too long today. It could take as long as two years from application to final clearance. We can't be competitive right. unless we speed that up. And so we have a plan now to cut that to about a half a year. Um, half a is, year, six months. Which is easier said than done in okay. the US government. And you know there are a lot of challenges involved in doing this, but it's absolutely essential to create a more diverse workforce, as I mentioned before, and to, you know, I mean, CIA, like lots of other uh, parts of American society, has been through a really tough year and a half with COVID and the impact that that has on officers and their families, not just in the US, but overseas as well. So to look at ways in which we can ease some of those burdens over time, because you know the most profound obligation that any leader has is to take care of your people. And so that has to do with COVID, it has to do with the phenomenon of anomalous health incidents, um, which you know a number of our officers have suffered. Right. It has to do with the pressures of issues like Afghanistan, you know, which shaped a whole generation 
of CIA officers over the last 20 years as well. So I'm, I'm very mindful of that as we look at what the workforce needs over the next decade or more. Right. I'd love to dig into all three of those a little in detail if we have time, but let's at least try with China mm -hmm. um, a little bit. So, you know, you and I were just talking, I'm writing this book about lessons from the Cold War for how to deal with China and Russia today. Yeah, I look forward to it. And I've been reading a lot of assessments from the 60s and the 70s and about power and power trajectory. And my main takeaway is how hard it is to understand power trajectories over 20, 30 year, 40 year periods. And with the Soviet Union, it's, it's how we overestimated. Mm -hmm. But in the 90s, you know, I, I remember my one time briefing President Bush, actually, I was gonna say the many times, there was just one. Uh, we had this debate about Russia, which you and I have talked about for decades. This was 2001. And in the room, there were two uh, schools of thought, one, Russia is a collapsed power and they're fading away and we don't need to deal with them. Um, and I, I said to the president, I said, well, you know, that's how the Bolsheviks uh, looked in 1918. And if you were doing a power assessment, 2021, you know, choose the year of the Civil War, you would have really got it wrong. You know, if you think about where they were 20 or 30 years out. And today, Russia most certainly is not where it was in 1991 or 2001. Help us understand how you get your arms around that with China, because measuring power, measuring threats to the, you know, obviously in an unclassified setting, but yeah. I, I'm curious how you wrestle with things that are 30 years in the future. How do you make predictions about them? It's not easy, you're right, and it's a very complicated um, business, especially when you're talking about such a complicated society as China. I mean, I think, the starting point for me is that Xi Jinping does not lack for either ambition or determination on these issues. I think it's a mistake to underestimate that. I think there's clearly a determination on the part of this Chinese leadership to become a military and technological peer of the United States. Um, and so, you know, you have to understand, I think, that drive and how it's translating in terms of capabilities. You have to under also understand that this is not a society that's 10 feet tall. I mean, they have their own challenges to deal with as well. I think it's also important to understand that the easiest thing to do sometimes in intelligence, as well as in diplomacy, is to sort of draw neat historical analogies yeah. as well. And as we've discussed before, I mean, I think there's some aspects of the management of the Cold War that are very useful to understand in terms of managing competition with China. There are other parts of that that can obscure more than they illuminate right. as well, because again, as, as you've written eloquently, I mean, there are a lot of things that are different um, between competition with China and competition with the Soviet Union. Um, competition with China for the United States spreads across virtually every domain there is, from cyberspace to space. It's technological, it's economic in a way that, you know, competition with the Soviet Union never was. Right. And our economies are, you know, entangled in some really profound ways as well. So understanding those differences, I think, is also important in looking at what the arc is likely to be. So from the point of view of CIA, our obligation is to provide you know, the best grounded intelligence we can as we look ahead to be, as I said before, have a dose of humility right. about, you know, the projections that we make and be, you know, have a sort of keen eye on, you know, some of those vulnerabilities that exist as well, too. Right. Right. And to understand, you know, our own strengths. I mean, strengths not just in terms of domestic renewal, which is the biggest challenge, I think, for the United States, but also the strengths that come with allies and partners that in a way set us apart from lonelier powers like China or, or Russia today as right. well. But what underpins that kind of a strategy, I think has to be good intelligence. Right. So I'm gonna ask two more questions just so people know. If you have your questions ready, we'll, get, we'll turn to the audience in a minute. Um, I wanna ask a different question about uh, not the long term, but the very short term. Mm. Uh, you know, I was in the government for five years with you in the first five years of the Obama administration, and I remember, I'm going to go through the list. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, unless it was compartmentalized uh, intelligence, uh, we, we as a government didn't predict the Green Revolution in Iran in 2009. We didn't predict the Arab Spring in 2011. We didn't predict mass protests in Russia in December 2011, or Ukrainian protests in 2013, or annexation of Crimea by Putin in 2014. Other than that, we were... Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, 
because you've used the, hu the word humility appropriately a few times, neither did political science, just so you know, uh, Director Burns. So uh, we're not very good at predicting those things. Um, and sometimes we get beat up that we don't predict the future. But, but I was always struck when I was in the government that when these events happen, they would turn to the, the representative from the intelligence community and say, well, why didn't you tell me that was going to happen? Um, and it's on my mind because of Afghanistan, yeah. of course. And I, I wonder how you think about that, that the, the assumption, mm -hmm. and maybe it shouldn't be an assumption, that somehow you're supposed to predict the short-term future and how you manage that in terms of expectations for the policymakers. Well, it is clearly our role to provide strategic warning. In other words, to see trend lines, especially troubling trend lines, and try to understand you know, how they're most likely to play out. What are going to be the variables that affect them? What are the second and third order consequences as well? Um, so does that mean that we, with mathematical precision, can say that you know, former President Ghani in Afghanistan is going to flee his office and not tell his senior most aides on the 15th of August? No. Um, that, but I also think that if you look back at the record on Afghanistan, I mean, as President Biden has said, events unfolded at a pace even faster than any of us had anticipated. Right. But, you know, if you, if you look back not only at the record of the classified analysis that we provided and others in the intelligence community provided, there's a very sober picture that we painted of some very troubling trend lines about what the impact was, the accelerating impact of full U.S. military withdrawal on that most intangible of qualities, political will, you know, the willpower of the Afghan leadership and hence the Afghan military to resist, and also the impact that that was having on Taliban plans and their reach across Afghanistan as right. well. And there, I think, you know, we, like you know, our colleagues elsewhere in the intelligence community, painted a pretty sober picture of what that was. In all those years as a policymaker, that's what I expected from the intelligence community. Right. I did not necessarily assume that there was going to be mathematically precise predictions of day X or day Y. Right. Because it was, you know, it's always difficult. You could see the troubling trend lines that produced demonstrations in Tahrir Square early in 2011 in Cairo. Right. You could see that for years. How that was actually going to unfold in real time is always a, a, a much trickier business. Right. Um, I don't know if you remember the historian at Harvard, Adam Ulam, mm -hmm. a very, very famous uh, scholar of Soviet foreign policy. He was asked once, why didn't you predict the fall of Khrushchev? Uh, and I don't know if this is true. It's alleged. I'm, I'm just secondhand. Uh, I, I, can't, I don't remember the, the book. Uh, I have the, all of his books. I don't remember it. But uh, he, allegedly, he said famously, well, if Khrushchev didn't predict his own fall, how, how was I supposed to do it? So uh, last question. And then I'm going to ask people, uh, because of COVID, we're going to ask you to come to the microphones and not touch them. I, I don't know if that matters, actually, in terms of science. but. That's what I've been told. Uh, and if you could just introduce yourself and then just ask one question, that would be great. So my last question, you, you hinted at a bit. Um, you know, I've been teaching here for a long time, for decades now. Um, and uh, there is, including, look at all these people here, and most of them are students, by the way. That is not always the case at our events, Bill, just so you know. Um, you know, I, I, I've heard this a hundred times. Professor McFall, you know, I'd love to serve my country, uh, but Google's going to pay me five times more, and it's going to take me two years right. to get a clearance, and I may not get it. And so help, I don't understand how, it, it, the, 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 the decision point is a really hard one for students at Stanford that have these incredible opportunities to do things in the private sector and elsewhere. Tell us, you know, make the case for why undergraduates or graduate students here should think about the CIA or, or U.S. Yeah. government service in general? Just Well, I mean, listen, my whole uh, life has been shaped by public service. I mean, I grew up as an Army brat. My dad was an Army officer. I spent almost you know, three and a half decades in the Foreign Service, and here I am as director of CIA. I remember, gosh, it was 1981 when I had been offered a place in the Foreign Service, and I was thinking about whether to do that and weighing against other things. And my dad, who was a retired major general who's since passed away a couple of months ago, remember wrote me a note. People wrote notes in those days. And I remember one line in it. He said, nothing can make you prouder than to serve your country with honor. I, to be honest with you, in 1981, I wasn't entirely persuaded. 
But, you know, here I am 40 years later, and, you know, I spent most of those four decades learning the truth of that particular piece of advice. So I'm just speaking from my experience, but it was a remarkable opportunity, and I was incredibly lucky along the way as a diplomat, just as I am today at CIA, to take on fascinating and very complicated challenges at really interesting moments on the international landscape, to work with smart, committed people, because um, oftentimes that's what motivated me more than, certainly more than income or anything else, in the service of something that, you know, I continue to think is really important, which is the interests of our country, and to perform that service in a way that's consistent with our values as well. And so, you know, I'm, I'm a believer um, in the virtues of public service and what it means to our country. I think it's especially important today you know, and as your generation looks out at this, there is profound mistrust of government institutions right now. Some of it's well earned. I mean, I've learned this the hard way over the years. But, you know, it's my obligation as a leader, as director of CIA, and it's your opportunity, I think, those of you who might think of, of you know, trying public service, whether it's at CIA or elsewhere in the US government, um, to try to demonstrate um, that we can produce institutions in this country, particularly at CIA, that are professional, that are apolitical, that are devoted to the national interest and in doing things in accordance with American values, and that could produce things that help our society and serve the elected political leadership well. That's tough to do in the current climate, but you know, that's what I'm determined to do at CIA, is to try to reinforce that reputation and then to demonstrate it in what, with all of our imperfections, with what we can produce. And I think that's, you know, that's what's animated, you know, my professional life over all these years. And um, I've been really lucky, as I said, anybody who underestimates serendipity as a part of your professional career is probably kidding themselves. Right. But I was really lucky, I did work hard, um, and, you know, and I think this has been incredibly rewarding for me with all the, the inevitable ups and downs and the successes and failures along the way. So I hope you know, all of you will try it. The one thing that um, I can ensure is that we'll at least cut the length of time it takes to, to actually get in, because I think that's discouraged a lot of people as well. The one other thing I'd say about CIA too is that, and it's a little bit by contrast to state, although people with you know, very varied backgrounds come into diplomacy, is the variety of you know, kind of occupational skills and backgrounds that people bring in. You know, we're a clandestine service in large part, so you see people who come in with backgrounds and everything from aeronautics to robotics to costume design to psychology <laughs> as well. Costume design. There you go. So there's, um, th there's a, a variety of skills that, that are needed. Obviously today, foreign languages and, and STEM you know, um, expertise is hugely important right now as you look at those priorities I was talking about before. But it's, um, it can be incredibly rewarding. So I hope, I hope some of you at least will consider it as well. And you know where to find me if anybody wants to talk more about it. <laughs> That's a great answer. Okay, we have 15 minutes for questions. Uh, I promised Amy Ziegart the first question because she was filling it. I came in today, I didn't know if you knew that, Bill. But Amy Ziegart, our senior fellow here at CSEC and at Hoover, who works on intelligence matters. Amy, I, Amy gets the first question, and then everybody else we can open up. And I look forward to your book, Amy. Well, I, I look forward to, to finishing it. So, <laughs> so Mike, I, I, know wanna, the I, wanna, I wanna thank you, especially because as a Z, I'm usually last, not first. Um, Director Burns, it's wonderful to have you here at Stanford. What I'd like to do is touch on something that you alluded to implicitly, and I wanna make it explicit, which is a driver of change. It's not just technology, but it's the changing role of the private sector yes. and its relationship to government. And so I often say government agencies need private sector capabilities they don't have, and private sector firms have responsibilities they don't want. So can you share a little bit more about your thinking about this changing role of the private sector, whether it's critical infrastructure owners or tech platforms? And in particular, can you share your thoughts about should CIA be thinking about its customers differently? Should the agency be producing intelligence for people without security clearances more, like voters, tech leaders, company leaders mm -hmm. in this changing landscape? 
It's a really good question, and it's something that, you know, I mean, as I implied, I think, in talking about our priorities, that I think we need to invest in much more energetically at CIA and probably across the U.S. government. Part of it is, as you said, it's for all the incredibly smart people, and some of them are here with me today, who work on tech, cyber, digital issues at the agency, there's nearly a third of all our, of our officers spend most of their days working on those issues. Two of our five directorates, digital innovation and science and technology, work exclusively on those issues. But for all of that talent to be more than the sum of our parts, we've got to engage more with private sector and the pace of innovation there on the whole range of technology issues. In order to do that effectively, we also have to demonstrate that you know, we have something that's of use as well. And so when we're talking about you know, everything from the challenges that many of those companies face on the global landscape to challenges posed by other intelligence services, you know, those are places where we have some insights that aren't going to benefit a particular company because that's not our business, but where the broad insights, I think, can be of use uh, to the private sector as well. So to, to build those kind of relationships over time are going to be really important. And what also that means is overcoming a lot of the mistrust, which has existed going back to Snowden and for all sorts of other reasons. I am acutely aware of that as well. But I think as we look at this new era unfolding before us, you're exactly right. That's got to be one of our highest priorities. Great, let's just bounce back and forth for seven minutes. And uh, for those in the back, if there are some virtual questions, if you could hand them to me, uh, we'll try to get to some of those. Please introduce yourself and ask a question. Hello, my name is Elf. I'm a political science uh, senior Hi. here at uh, Stanford. Uh, you mentioned the geopolitical challenge from the rise of China, the mission specifically to address it, and the potential uh, benefits of the lessons that could be uh, drawn from the Cold War. And I wanted to ask whether if the world becomes, uh, as some predict, again, multi-hegemonic, bipolar, uh, how do you think that will shape the CIA's role? And how would the CIA of now differ, differ from or would be similar to the CIA of the Cold War? Well, see, I think a lot of, it's a really good question. I mean, as I was saying before to Mike, I mean, I think it can oftentimes obscure more than illuminate the kind of analogies between the Cold War with the Soviet Union. So I think we're going to be dealing with an international landscape in which power is more diffuse than it's been. Diffuse not just among states, as I said, but with non-state actors as well. And so as important as it's going to be for CIA to give policymakers the best intelligence, the best insights we can offer on Chinese intentions and capabilities, we've got a wide range of other issues that we're going to have to focus on as well. We've got to up our game on technology and cyber issues because you know, we're going to face challenges as a country um, and as a society that are come not just from China but from lots of other players, especially as you look at the proliferation of you know, AI technologies and everything else. You know, as concerning as competition with China is, equally concerning is going to be the proliferation of those kind of technologies to non-state actors as well. And, and that's also a part of you know, what our job needs to be too. So Thank here you. and then over to Mike. Hi, my name is Christina Hill, and I'm a Hi. current master's student in the Russia Studies Department. Uh, my question is actually based on a fantastic article that Professor Ziegert wrote in The Atlantic a month ago. Uh -huh. um, uh, she mentioned that, you know, uh, during the Cold War, the CIA had a bit of a makeover. Um, the director was from the DOD, and so, you know, the, there was like a mix of intelligence and defense, and it was just like all combining. Now, obviously, with your background, with the diplomatic background, do you feel as if there's also going to be a change of the landscape? Like, rather than being so much about the war on terror and defense, and as we've left Afghanistan, do you think there is a different mission now, a more diplomatic mission, perhaps, like, or a more eclectic mission than, than what was previously? Well, I think this definitely, as Amy argued in that piece in Atlantic, is one of those moments of transition. It is for the CIA as well. I mean, the last 20 years of the CIA's sort of, you know, professional mission have been largely wrapped up in, in counterterrorism as well. Now, that's not going away, as I said before, and we do not have the luxury of neglecting those kind of challenges, which are more diffuse around the world than they were 20 years ago. The good news is we have more effective partners as well. We share more information. But we're also going to have to shift gears a little bit in the direction of some of those big emerging priorities, especially the geopolitical challenge of China. 
as well. So yeah, I think this is one of those moments of transition. It's one of those moments when we, like lots of other parts of the US government, need to shift gears. But it's always going to be a complicated balancing act. And that's you know, one of the challenges of government. Thank you. Thanks. Mike. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mike Salito. I'm the Deputy Director of the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered AI and Hi, uh, formerly had the pleasure of working for Director Burns at the State Department just before he retired. Nice to uh, see where you. Where I covered counterterrorism. And I actually have a question that follows on a little bit from the previous one. There was a lot of criticism of the CIA's focus on counterterrorism over the last 20 years, potentially taking away attention that could be directed elsewhere. And one of the features of that focus was a real operational focus, right, on CIA conducting operations which of course uh, can be authorized by the president under a, a covert action finding. I guess the question is not specifically about you know, whether that was a good idea, but would you, uh, given that you've uh, talked a lot about how the, the main role of the mission of uh, the CIA is intelligence analysis, intelligence support and advice uh, and not operations, do you think it's a mistake to allow the CIA to get too you know, quickly drawn into too many operational activities as opposed to that primary intelligence gathering and analysis mission? Well, you've got to balance both is the honest answer. I mean, we still have really important operational responsibilities. You know, sometimes it's to disrupt, you know, imminent threats to Americans and to our homeland. Sometimes it's to work with other agencies to disrupt ransomware attacks and those kind of things. So I don't want to underestimate the importance of those operational capabilities for a moment. What I do believe, as I said before, is that, you know, this is a moment where we have to shift gears a little bit and direct both those operational, technological, as well as analytical capabilities, um, you know, more and more toward a, a newer set of priorities, even as we try to balance a lot of these more familiar ones as well. Hello, my name's Robert Nelson. I'm a PhD student in the political science department. Hi. Um, my question is um, one that we'll ask you to put your diplomat hat back on a little bit because it's about uh, something you worked on inside and outside of government, which is the JCPOA. Mm -hmm. um, and That's where I got most of my gray hair. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, my question is, um, if you could explain sort of the thinking of the Biden administration about why when they took, you know, came into office, they didn't immediately rescind the Trump era sanctions that brought the U.S. out of compliance, because it, it's conceivable that that would have, A, you know, been good to do while Rouhani was still in charge. And then second, it would put sort of Iran in a position where either they would have to come into compliance or it would show to the world that it's Iran, not us, that blew up the JCPOA. Yeah. So I'm just sort of curious what the thinking in the White House was on that topic at See, the time. you're keeping my nostalgia for diplomacy under control. <laughs> those, uh, those, those are really complicated issues too. And you know, like any kind of negotiation or diplomatic effort, it requires two to tango as well. And you know, I know from my own experience that you know, the Iranians, this Iranian regime can be very complicated to do business with on those issues. So, you know, I think there's still a possibility. I mean, here I take a step back from my current role, but there's, there's still a possibility of coming back into full compliance with the JCPOA. Um, there's a big question mark over how serious the new Iranian government is in that as well, but there's still a willingness um, that President Biden has made very clear to do that. There's also the challenge though, that as you well know, you know, Iranian actions well beyond the nuclear program pose, you know, huge threats to our interests as well as the interests of lots of our friends and partners across the Middle East and sometimes even beyond that region as well. Development of ballistic missiles and the increasing sophistication and lethality of UAVs, the ways in which, you know, this Iranian regime destabilizes a lot of its neighbors. And so, even if there were progress on the nuclear issue, we're still left with a lot of those problems as well. And in my current role at CIA, you know, we have to be preoccupied with all of those across the board. So, you know, I still think, you know, having invested a lot in, in that agreement, having led the secret talks in 2013 that helped contribute to it, that we'd all have been better off if the last administration had stayed in that agreement. I think the trend line since then have been very negative on both the nuclear issue as well as on those regional issues that I was talking about. So I hope there's a possibility of going back to it, but it's still going to leave a lot of other challenges from this Iranian regime that we have to look at you know, very, very sharply. Thank, Thank you. you. So Director Burns is on a pretty tight schedule. I see four people in this line and we have four minutes. 
I'll give short answers. I'm, I'm going to propose each of you just take, uh, it, ask the question. Oh, five people. Uh, all right. <laughs> all five of you, if you could just ask 15 second questions and then you can decide how much you want to answer or not. Sure. So, Don, just take us away. Five. Very okay. quickly, 15 everybody, seconds please. is a little tricky. My name is Don Emerson. I work Hi. upstairs at the Asia Pacific Research Center. And now he's got to talk really fast, Don. <laughs> nice you to only give me 15 seconds. So, and, and I'd <laughs> like to revisit the question of the interface between policy on the one hand and intelligence on the other. Mm -hmm. I'd like to put you in the Oval Office facing Biden. Now, you begin, what are you talking about, China, Afghanistan, whatever, Russia? You begin with facts, right? Description, mm -hmm. no problem. Description, that's safe. That's mm -hmm. quite safe. But the president wants analysis. So you provide the analysis, and then the president wants you to predict the future, what's more likely to happen. And you adopt the following pattern. You give him three scenarios, mm -hmm. right? Because it's up to him to choose, not up to you. Mm -hmm. But in fact, the middle scenario, which tilts neither to the extreme first one or the extreme third one, is the optimal one. This might be called sort of the principle of the obvious middle, which is an influence on policy. Does that ever happen? Yeah. Great question. Keep going, though, everybody. I'll give a short answer on that one, Don. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure I've been guilty of that myself on both sides of the table. So. Hi, so my name is Rong Fei. So Hi. my question is regarding the challenges of China and there's more importance of more nuanced cultural understanding of China. Mm -hmm. While there are a lot of challenges of Asian Americans entering public service because of suspicion of foreign interference. So how is CIO the general intelligence or State Department address those issues of diversity? That, that is a really important question, and I'm glad you asked it, because one of the things I've tried hardest to do over the last seven months in notes to our workforce and walking around talking to people is to make absolutely clear that our understandable focus on the challenge posed by China is about the Chinese leadership, it's about the People's Republic of China, it's not about the people of China, and it certainly is not about Asian Americans or Americans of Chinese descent as well. And, um, and I will continue to try to reinforce that as well because I think one of the most dangerous dimensions sometimes of those kind of long-term competitions is it tends to get generalized then and we forget what the focus is as well. So I'm, I'm really glad that you mentioned that and it's one of the things I've continued to try to hammer home and I will continue to. So thank you. Hi, my name is Zoe. I'm a computer science student here, Hi. and I wanted to ask, um, who do you think is the biggest technological threat to the U.S., especially looking at how Russia influenced U.S. elections? Well, I mean, I think in terms, and many of you in this room know this better than I do, I think in terms of broad capacity across the range of, of emerging technologies, I think China probably today is, but I would never underestimate, Mike knows this as well as anyone, the capacity of this Russian leadership to make really good asymmetrical use of a variety of cyber tools to influence everything from our own political dysfunction in this country to, you know, whether it's state actors, as was the case in Solar Winds, you know, responsible for attacks on, on, on you know, our most important uh, assets, or whether it's, you know, criminal gangs who happen to be operating not too far from St. Petersburg engaged in ransomware. The last I saw, you know, President Putin is rarely shy about exercising control over his own <laughs> territory. And so, you know, this has been the nature of, of the discussion President Biden has been having with him, the importance of exercising that control because, you know, those kind of ransomware attacks can be a threat to all of us unless there's some basic rules of the road as well. Thank you. Sure. Okay, last two, you're working through them. Sure. Thanks. Um, hi, uh, Dan. I'm a research assistant at CSAC, and uh, I wanted you to elaborate a bit more, if possible, on the open source data avalanche challenge yes. you alluded to, and uh, specifically whether there's any room for CIA to interact with the growing OSINT community outside of the government. Thank you. There, there certainly is. It's a really important question. As you know better than I do, something like 90% of the data in circulation today has been produced in the last couple of years it's gonna be increasingly important to good analysis from the CIA as well as the whole US uh, intelligence community. So we need to work even more effectively with our partners in the intelligence community, but we also have to engage you know, in a much more systematic way, I think, with people outside government as well, because we have a lot to learn, as I was saying before, about how best to get through all those haystacks of information and data 
to get at the needles which really matter most to good analysis as well. So it's, it's, it's going to be one of the most significant challenges that we face, and it's not going to be done within the government alone, for sure. Thank you so much. Thank Great. You. Last question. Okay. I'll try to make this as quick as possible. Um, sure. My name is Melissa Carlson. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at CSAC. My research looks at uh, cooperation between governments and foreign militants, especially in the Middle East. Yes. And so my question it really focuses on that. I was wondering if you could talk about lessons, uh, lessons learned from CIA operations in the Middle East, thinking about Operation Timber Sycamore and kind of what missteps or failures through, uh, of this operation how it might impact kind of the CIA's role in working with armed non-state actors in the region in the future. Hmm. Well, I mean, we've learned a lot of lessons, I think, over the years, um, you know, sometimes the hard way about what works and what doesn't work. On the other hand, I think, you know, we, along with other parts of the U.S. government, have played a really crucial role in helping to um, reduce you know, the number of serious threats to American interests, whether it's in the homeland or elsewhere in the Middle East. And I think that's going to remain, you know, a very important priority in, in our work, not just for CIA, but across the U.S. government. But what have we learned? It, it makes sense to have effective partners um, in the region, and that's a region which has some very complicated partners as well. I recognize that. It does make sense to have a certain sense of humility as well about what we know and what we don't know and what, what are the second and third order consequences of some operations going to be. It makes sense to be careful about that too. But the challenge is not going to go away, I don't think, uh, unfortunately, you know, given the you know, proliferation of non-state um, actors and you know, a variety of terrorist groups as well. You know, today we see both, you know, it's al-Shabaab in Somalia as well as um, al-Qaeda on the Arabian Peninsula as well, which, you know, pose quite serious threats. So we need to work, you know, even more effectively with, you know, foreign partners around the world, share information if we're going to reduce that threat and help protect American society. And that's our obligation. So I want to say three things in closing. Uh, first, can everybody remain seated until Director Burns leaves? Uh, uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, he'll get out of here quickly, so don't worry. This will go right to my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, second, uh, Bill, I thought it was a fantastic, inspired choice by the president to nominate you for, to run the CIA, and that hypothesis was reconfirmed today. Uh, and third, I just want you all to join me in thanking Director Burns for taking time out of his busy schedule to be with us today.